The verdict is in for the U.S. The Chicago Tribune's front page this morning saying we are unanimously divided after the acquittal of Kyle Rittenhouse. The one truly unanimous thing is the jury's decision. By most accounts, the right verdict under Wisconsin law, to which Adam Serwer of The Atlantic says, it is one thing to argue that the jury reached a reasonable verdict based on the law and another entirely to celebrate Rittenhouse's actions. That celebration is underway, however, among right-wing content crusaders. It's been underway ever since Friday afternoon. They are lionizing the 18-year-old, lifting him up and promoting a pro-gun culture. As you can see here, Fox is in bed with Rittenhouse, filming him late at night on the couch for a documentary by Tucker Carlson's production unit. Carlson revealed on Friday that he had a crew embedded behind the scenes with Rittenhouse throughout the trial. And a portion of his interview with the 18-year-old is going to air on Monday. So Fox is using the Rittenhouse story to drive subscriptions for its streaming service. And the right-wing media has also seized on this moment to slam the rest of the media for the trial coverage. I do think there's an important conversation to be had about why so many folks had a misunderstanding about some of the facts in this case. Yes, there was a lot of confusion in August of 2020, but we learned during the trial that some of the assumptions were faulty. Some left-wing outlets provided a skewed picture of what happened on that awful night in Kenosha, and there's been confusion ever since. This coverage, of course, has been dominating cable news for days. So I want to bring in three voices that you haven't heard on this network yet, uh, beginning with the president of the Law and Crime Network, Rachel Stockman, plus the uh, former media critic for the Baltimore Sun, David Zerwick, and the senior editor for The Dispatch, also a Time Magazine columnist, David French. Thank you all for assembling today. David French, first to you. Uh, you've been writing about this case uh, in detail. Uh, what do you think is the takeaway uh, when it comes to the Rittenhouse verdict and the media? Well, one of the takeaways is that I think the media dropped the ball. Parts of the media dropped the ball on covering this case from the start because Right from the start, there were a couple of things that were pretty immediately obvious. One was we knew what Wisconsin self-defense law was, and the other one was there was a lot of video evidence out there in the public domain. And what the video evidence showed was that Rittenhouse was being chased before he fired fatal shots, that he was knocked to the ground, he was attacked before he fired fatal shots. And if you knew Wisconsin self-defense law and you knew sort of the rules around open carry, then you knew he was going to have a strong defense. But what a lot of people did is they took the foolishness of being there, the recklessness of being there in and of itself, a 17-year-old armed with a rifle going to a riot to social unrest, that's ridiculous. 17-year-olds shouldn't be doing that. And they conflated that with all that followed. And that's a big mistake. That's not how juries look at it. Juries look at the law. They compare the law to the facts. And under Wisconsin self-defense law, he had a strong defense. And honestly, it was pretty apparent from the beginning that he had a strong defense. How much of this is about slogans that were attached early on, like the slogan about crossing state lines, you know, and how much this is about information that didn't come out right away, that only came out at trial, that then changed the picture? You know, I think trial fleshed it out. But okay. there, was an, there were an awful lot of people who knew the contours of the defense early on. The videos mm. were out there early on. And I think there were media outlets who just did a disservice by not noting that Rittenhouse was running away. This is somebody not, who was not aggressively approaching people. He was running away. Mm. And her, even under Wisconsin self-defense law, there's some, sort, there's some modified versions of a duty to retreat, but some, he was being pursued by that first, the first person he shot very aggressively. And so these kinds of things were not amplified enough and so that's one of the reasons why I think the verdict took millions of Americans by surprise on its own terms separate and apart from the question of should he have been there which I don't think he should have been there that you don't give a 17 year old a rifle and encourage a 17 year old with a rifle to go to a riot that is not what you do but those things were being conflated with the legal elements of the crime mm, itself right I see what you're saying news whiplash do you feel it? Every day, every week, there's a new narrative, some new extreme. And it feels to me like whiplash. This is definitely true in political coverage, uh, where President Biden is the worst of all time or then the best of all time, or he's collapsing or he's succeeding, either he's saving the country or his presidency needs saving. And every week is portrayed as climactic, even cataclysmic. 
horrible losses, huge wins, and there's a hot take for every conceivable issue. This is also true when it comes to coverage of the economy. There's been a rightful focus on sky-high prices, on increasing gas prices, but obviously less attention when those prices come back down a bit. Inflation, another example of this whiplash with question after question about what Biden will do or what he can do when it comes to inflation. Now, of course, uh, those, those losses come along with wins. Here was the, the celebration on the House floor as Democrats passed the Build Back Better Act. But before they can celebrate, there's always more whiplash. There's always another narrative, uh, another news cycle that gets in the way. And it feels to me like the pandemic is a part of every one of the stories we are covering these days, even if it doesn't always come up in the coverage. We are all coming through this historic trauma, this historic period of time. And it might cause some people just to want to pull back from the news altogether when there are endless hot takes and memes and uh, uh, social media friendly headlines that seem to make every story seem so important when, in fact, what really matters are the trend lines. What really matters um, are not every individual poll, but the average of the polls, right? The polls over time when it comes to Biden. But the news is always up at a 10 or 11. How do you bring it back down to a five or a six? How do you separate news from noise? I know that's something that David French does very well. It's why I love reading him at the dispatch. Let me bring him back in. Uh, he's the author of Divided We Fall, America's Succession Threat and How to Restore Our Nation. Uh, there's obviously a, you know, there's something about the divides here that relates to my sense of whiplash lately, David. Uh, how, how do you keep your head on straight in this environment where the news is always at a 10 or 11, even when it should really be down a little bit lower? I mean, first you have to acknowledge it's hard. It's hard because there's always voices saying, say something now, say something now, say something right. now, be strong now. But I think that if I had to sum up two words that are absolutely necessary in this time is I think from media to politicians to corporations, people want individuals and institutions that are calm and competent. Calm and I competent. I think that's true. I think most people want that. But that's like the not very vocal mind, uh, majority. It's, it's like a silent majority, sorry. Uh, because there are these media incentive structures on the far right and far left to be incredibly loud and divisive. Well, that's right. And there's actually research that says that there is not so much a silent majority, but an exhausted majority. These are the people, they care about this country. They're on the right, they're in the left, they're in the middle. But they're recoiling from the political discourse because entering it is like getting shocked with a cattle prod. You're going to get hit by the really loud voices. And so what's absolutely vital is for important media institutions and individuals within the media and American politics to take it upon themselves to do their best to bring calm. And my, when I say calm, that doesn't mean don't react when there are true emergencies, but don't treat everything as an emergency. Take a breath, take a beat, evaluate what's going on, and then speak from knowledge, speak from expertise, less so than from opinion or herd mentality because again and again we're seeing these herd mentalities where media get stories wrong in a big way where politicians react wrongly in a in a big way and it's that that demand we have to have an ability to take a breath take in the scene cut through that sort of fog of war that confusion when complex events are unfolding quickly and be competent in what we deliver and that's easier said than done these are complex yeah. things they're hard but when that's a priority, rather than responding to the outrage of the moment on Twitter, I think we can do something about this situation. Do something right. about the situation we're in. So I should put down this Red Bull. I need a little less energy, maybe, for a, for a change. <laughs> so calm and competent. Here's what I find myself doing, David. I find myself looking for guideposts, quotes, you know, messages that sum up the environment we're in. You you, you wrote recently about J.D. Vance, the Ohio Senate candidate, and eight words that in some ways define our politics right now in the worst way. He said, he said to the American conservative, he said, I think our people hate the right people. Now, to me, unfortunately, that sums up where we are on the extremes of our politics in 2021. And I always go back to those eight words as, you know, as what's pulling us apart. Our people hate those people. That, that's exactly correct. And he's accurately summing up the hatred, not, not that you can hate the right people. There are no right people to hate to be clear. But what he's summing up is the, is the, the dynamic in play. But again, what we have to go back to 
is this is not where most people want American politics to be. And mm. it's wrong to say they're all in the moderate middle. That, that's not the case. There are people on the left, there are people on the right, and yes, there are people in the middle who do not want a politics dominated by hatred. They don't, and they're looking for outlets, they're looking for voices, they're looking for politicians, they're looking for celebrities, you name it. All of these participants in this big cultural, seemingly endless cultural struggle we're all a part of, you're looking for those voices that are not voices of hate. But right now in politics, the politics are driven by the polls. The politics are driven by the most ang angry extremes. Those are, that's where the clicks are. That's where the, the eyeballs are often. Uh, sadly, on cable news and internet world where I live, that's where the eyeballs are. <laughs> and so this is, this is the challenge that we face. In many ways, you're turning away from the eyeballs you need when you're right. going towards calm, competent uh, analysis. I'm, I'm into it though, C and C. I wrote it down, <laughs> let's come back to it soon. David, thank you much for coming on the program. Thanks so much for having me.